Hey, if it's your first time with us before we dive into the word, if it's your first time with us, I want to encourage you to take that connect card that you were handed on the way in, that printed connect card, and would you fill it out? And at the end of this uh, gathering, the end of our time, uh, the offering plates will go by. You can put that um, card in the offering plates, or you can stop by our next step area in the back. Uh, if you'd rather fill out a digital uh, connect card, scan the seat back in front of you. If you're online with us, there's a link in the comment section. You can uh, just click on that link that's dropped in the comment section. And we want to get to know you. We want to uh, help you take next steps into this family of faith, this community of faith, hope, and love called Discovery Church. We want to know how we can pray for you. All of that is the purpose of the Connect card. It's not just to spam you with more text messages and emails. Like anyone need another spam email or text message? I think not. I think not. And so uh, we promise to not do that to you. <laughs> uh, right. Matthew chapter 5. I want to encourage you, if you don't have a Bible, a printed Bible, we have some in the back. We'd love for you to take a Bible uh, and open it up with us, read it, own it. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus, Jesus took six important Old Testament laws, beginning in verse 21, six important Old Testament laws, and interpreted them for his people in light of the new life that he came to give. So don't miss this. We're going to look at these six heavy Laws today, God willing, we're going to look at three. The next week, God willing, three. But six Old Testament laws in the remainder of Matthew chapter five. And Jesus interprets them. If you remember, you recall, he sits down on this mountainside, beautiful view of the Sea of Galilee. There's a perfect part of this mountainside where it amplifies for all to be able to hear. This is like 2,000 years ago. There's, there's no speakers. And uh, just in case you were wondering. Uh, and so, um, and he begins to teach. He begins to instruct the disciples, the crowds, because of who he is. It's Jesus, right? Because of his fame, they begin to, they begin to gather around. And so he he takes these six important Old Testament laws, interprets them for his people in light of the new life that he came to give. Jesus made a, a fundamental change without altering God's standards. Uh, we're going to see that here. Jesus makes a fundamental change without altering God's standards. The Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, they believed that righteousness consisted of performing certain actions. Their, their, their hope, their belief system was all based around actions. That if they just performed these specific actions, it would be good enough. They would attain righteousness through actions. But Jesus, but Jesus comes on the scene. And what he says is that it centers around the attitudes of the heart. So oftentimes we think, man, that person's got their life together. You know, I mean, be honest. Who's ever thought that? Somebody? You've looked at somebody? I mean, even last night, y'all scrolling on Instagram and you think that person's got their life together. We never post the, like, the real and the raw, though, right? The, the, the meltdowns, the tears, the, the challenges, the, like, even negative bank accounts. I mean, we never post that kind of stuff. Because we want people to think that we have it all together. And Jesus comes onto the scene and he says, I'm more focused on your heart, what's going on inside, rather than your exterior. Why is that? Because once Jesus has a hold of our heart, the exterior begins to change. How many of you are witnesses to that? I mean, you just don't talk like you used to. You don't do what the things that you used to. There's a, a change in your life. In fact, I would challenge you today, those in the house and online, if there's never been a change, I would question everything. Have I truly surrendered my life over to Jesus if there's never been a change? Because with Jesus comes a, a change. Jesus changes everything. And so again, the religious leaders of the day, and this is helpful 
for our time, especially as we study the scriptures, the context of what we're looking at, what's before us. The religious leaders of the day believed that righteousness consisted of performing certain actions, but Jesus said it centered in the attitudes of the heart. See, sin comes from the attitudes of the heart. That's what, that's what we're going to see. Sin comes from the attitudes uh, of the heart. Anger is murder in the heart. That's what Jesus says. Lust is adultery in the heart. So the big sin in our society and, and all sin in reality starts in the heart. Starts in the heart. That's why we need to protect our heart. That's why we need to, Proverbs tells us to guard our heart because there comes the source of life. That's why we better be putting on that full armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6, Paul's writing to the church in Ephesus. It's a battle of culture collide as to what Christ and his standard is teaching. And Paul writes to the church in Ephesus and he says, put on the full armor of God. Why? So that you'll be able to withstand the attacks, withstand the temptations, the fiery darts that are coming your way. Because they're coming, whether you like them or not, they're coming. So we need to be putting on the full armor of God every day. And so today we're going to press in on this main idea that it all starts in the heart. It all starts in the heart. Look at this first Old Testament law. It's murder, murder. Jesus refers to Exodus chapter 20, verse 13. In case you want to know, Exodus chapter 20, verse 13 is this Old Testament law of murder. You have heard that it was said to our ancestors, do not murder. And whoever murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Whoever insults his brother or sister will be subject to the court. Whoever says, you fool, will be subject to hellfire. Pause right there. Jesus says that anger is murder in the heart. And oftentimes we we, we, we condemn, not even criticize, but we condemn murderers. And don't get me wrong, it's... It's a, tra- it's a tragedy uh, every time we hear of a death, a murder. It's a tragedy, particularly right here in, in our community because it's so present next door. But oftentimes we think that we are better than someone else because we haven't committed this particular sin. And we're condemning people. And then Jesus comes on the scene and what does he say? Whoever murders will be subject to the uh, judgment. But I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Jesus describes the stages of sin in verses 21 and 22. Do you see it in the Bibles before you? He describes the stages of sin. He starts with the like the big ones of society and then kind of then kind of goes down like to what we would consider the more innocent. They're just fun, Uh, but it it all works together if we're not careful, and this is one of the enemy's game plan, right, for you to be so comfortable in in sin that you uh, are are sinning even in the next level before you are even unaware of it. That's what we see, the the stages of sin. Do do you see it with me? We see it starts with name calling. We think it's just so innocent. I shared at the 9 a.m., like when we were in middle school, there was a whole lot of name calling, and, and you just called other names. And you didn't even know some of the names you were saying. You just did it, right? Popular in the day was, was JIT. You know, we called everybody JIT. And then it, before we knew it, it like started as kind of like a, a, a little dagger, but then it was like, oh, that became just like a friend, you know? <laughs> uh, and so we've been so comfortable. And, and Jesus says the, describes these stages of sin, starts with name calling, and then the next goes to insults. All right, next thing we know, we're insulting someone. Why do we often insult people? Because it makes us feel better in the moment, right? If we're honest, it makes us feel a little bit better. It takes the heat off of us. And, and so we see the, the, the stage it starts with what we would consider as a society a little more innocent with name calling. Then it goes to, to insults and then anger. Next thing we know, we're living with angry. And oftentimes we don't even know why we're angry. Because the last thing that made us angry, we never resolved it. And so we're angry. You know, we got anger upon anger. It's like that Christmas, uh, you know, that, that, 
January bonfire of all the Christmas trees thrown in there, you know? We go from the little cute one, the little warm you up one, to the big old fire. And, uh, and it happens before we even are aware that anger is building within us. And then Jesus starts with this, this last that you might think, I would never do such a thing. I mean, often, you know, we, we have this thought, if I were to ask you, were you going to ever murder someone? You're like, no, absolutely not. Uh, I know the, I know the, 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 the consequences, <laughs> you know, or whatever it is. But this is what Jesus is saying. It starts so small and so subtle. And we allow over time sin to grow within us. And each stage, we become more and more comfortable with sin. Look to verse 23. Verse 23, so if you are offering your gifts on the altar and there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled with your brother or sister and then come and offer your gift. Reach a settlement quickly with your adversary while you're on the way with him to the court or your adversary will hand you over to the judgment and the judge to the officer, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out of there until you have paid the last penny. We see this matter of reconciliation. Do you know the church is called reconciliation? Paul instructs the church in Corinth to be ministers of reconciliation. That's you and I. That's not just the pastor. That's all of us. We're called as believers in Christ Jesus to participate in the ministry of reconciliation. To be, to, to be reconciled one to another. If someone has offended you, be reconciled. If someone has, has hurt you uh, or said some things or insulted you, then, then to be reconciled. And Jesus is teaching here and he says, hey, even if you've shown up to the church house and you're presenting your offering and you remember someone as hurt you or you've hurt someone else, there's an offense. Then leave it there. Go take care of it quickly and come on back. Reconciliation, as you might already know, is only possible with the right heart. And so many times we are waiting for the other person to be ready for us to take place uh, for reconciliation to take place for us to make that move and would you trust Jesus that he is big enough would you seek godly counsel to be able to take that step towards real reconciliation we, we all want to be mature people no one wants to be called an immature person right <laughs> we all want to act as if our life is so mature what I love to I want to see the maturity in, in me and in our church. I want to see it, not just hear it. I, I don't want people walking around, look how mature I am. Because, because, because if we're honest, it, it, it's a gauge is how mature, immature you, you are. <laughs> Let's just live it. Let's just act it. Act it through our, through our actions. May we live the life of maturity. That's what our children need to see too. They don't just need to hear it. They need to see it in us. Reconciliation is only possible, though, with the right heart. And, and, and so when was the last time you paused, got alone with the Lord, and said, God, would you, uh, would you reveal areas of my heart, areas of my life that aren't pleasing to you, areas that I've missed it? Is there any wicked way within me? Would you, would you expose it to me? Would you forgive me that I can move forward? We see in verse 25, do you, do you see it? Reach a settlement quickly. Do you see that? Don't prolong the thing. Reach the settlement quickly. Reach the conflict quickly. Seek re reconciliation quickly. Act quickly. Why? In the context, particularly with anger, why? Because anger makes us one of two people. Anger makes us either destroyers or builders. Destroyers or builders. And I, I wonder who you are. We as the church are called to be builders. We're living in a, a dark society. We're living in difficult times. There's, a, there's enough destroyers all around. 
Every neighborhood's got them. <laughs> and you, that face just crossed the mind, eyes mind, just now as I said it. We have enough to, destroyers. The church of Jesus needs to be builders. We need to build people up. We're told in Thessalonians to build one another up, to encourage each other. That's the call in our lives. That's certainly a mark of spiritual maturity. So I'm coming alongside this person and building them up rather than bringing them down. See, anger also, if we allow it and don't settle the conflict quickly, it robs us of freedom. It robs us of, of your freedom. And anger will walk you back into that prison that you have been set free from. If there's anyone that's been set free by the grace of Jesus, by his kindness, been saved, been set free, and you've walked out of that prison that you were once held in bondage to. There's a free life in Christ. Jesus said in John 10, 10, that he's come that you might have life and life more abundant. Romans 8 says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's freedom in Christ Jesus. And I'll tell you, if you're sitting with anger today, you, you look around. And all you're going to see are walls because you've walked back into the prison cell that you were set free from. Act quickly. Now, sinful feelings are not excuses for sinful actions. Hear, hear this clearly. Perhaps even write that down and consider it throughout this week. Sinful feelings are not excuses for sinful actions. A lot of times we rationalize and justify why we've done what we've done based on how we feel. And can I, can I just encourage us? Uh, don't follow your heart. The world tells you to follow your heart. That's the biggest scam that's out there. Show me in the word of God where it says follow your heart. We see in the word of God where your heart is deceitful. We, we, we are a changing people. One day we're, we're this away, and one day we're that away. We're a changing people. Jesus is the only one who doesn't change. He's the same today as he was yesterday, as he's going to be tomorrow. So follow Jesus closely. Don't, don't follow your heart or your, your, your feelings. Your, your feelings are going to lie to you. You don't really need that, that whole pizza that's in front of you. But your, your feelings are telling you, man, go all in. Sinful feelings are not excuses for sinful actions. There might be this anger living inside of you, which you surrendered over to the Lord Jesus so that you don't act on that anger that's living within you. Would you ask the Lord to remove that anger so that you can walk in freedom? Sinful anger must be faced uh, humbly and honestly. How do we face it humbly and honestly? It, it, it will be quite challenging, and I don't, you will never get there if uh, you're trying to battle anger uh, with, with pride, allowing pride to lead the way. Throughout Scripture, we see this call to humility. We see this call to clothe ourselves in humility. So how do we deal with sinful anger? We, we, we face it humbly and then honestly. A lot of times we're, we're trying to you know, like fake out God, if, if you will. It's never ended well for anyone. Can I just tell you? <laughs> those that have tried, those that have tried to like, uh, I'm bringing my best church face on today. Everything looks all good. Nobody knows what's going on in here. And can I tell you today, there's, it might be true that no one in here might know what's going on in here. But there is one who is above all things. Scripture tells us that the eyes of the Lord are in every place. He knows exactly what's going on within you or within your home. Would you be honest before the Lord? And would you be honest before, before others? We must take it to God and those to whom we're angry with. We must get the matter settled Quickly, listen, the longer we wait, 
the longer we wait, the worse it gets. We got people that have been waiting years, hoping that it just goes away, hoping that the anger just goes away. But whenever that situation is brought up, whenever that person is brought up, it's a test. Have we really sought the reconciliation? Have we found the forgiveness in Christ Jesus? Have we leaned in to the Lord our God? The longer we wait, the worse it gets, the more it grows within us and takes hold of our lives. That's what anger does. And anyone that's, that's battled with this, you, you know exactly what I mean. The longer we hold it in, an explosion's coming. The question is when? When will it happen? And who will be around? So I want to encourage us. Settle the matter quickly. The second uh, Old Testament law that we see is adultery. Verse 27, you have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. Jesus is referring to Exodus chapter 20, verse 14, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 18. He says, you have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And he says this, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Jesus ain't playing here. <laughs> uh, he says, uh, everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You might be sitting there thinking, man, I'm good. I've been faithful. I've never, I've never committed uh, you know, adultery on, on my, my spouse. Uh, uh, but shame on that person. Shame on that person for doing that. And, and what Jesus is saying, is, hey, even if you've looked, even if you've looked at a woman lustfully and flipped the, flip the script, particularly in today's society, flip the script. Even women, if you look, lustfully, or, uh, and you've committed adultery. Lust is adultery in the heart. Uh, see, what's before us is that Jesus affirmed God's law of purity. That, that's why this law was instituted, so that there would be purity, there would be a sanctity. And, and so uh, Jesus affirmed God's law of purity, the intent of, of this law was to reveal the sanctity of sex and the sinfulness of the human heart. Don't, 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 don't miss this. The intent of this law was to reveal the sanctity of sex and the sinfulness of the human heart. I want what I want. Would you be honest enough to say that? Don't raise your hand if you've ever said that. I said that like last week. <laughs> I want what I want uh, is prevalent in our society, but listen to me closely. It is not in line with the word of God. I, I challenge you. Dig into the word of God. Show me. Show me where, hey, whatever you want is good. God's like, yeah, you know, good. You know, whatever you think, yeah, go for it. Whatever you want, go for it. It's, uh, it's become so prevalent in our society, but it is not in line with the word of God. See, God created sex, and listen, God protects sex. God's design for sex between a man and a, and, and a woman and the context of marriage, don't miss this, and the context of marriage is not to rob us of fun or pleasure, but it's to bless us. Oh, I want you to hear this today. Oftentimes we think, oh, all these rules. You know, remember as a kid, like, why do I have all these rules? It's to protect you. It's to bless you. It's to create disciplines within you. And, and so we have this idea, we have this idea that God's design for the sanctity of the marriage, the sanctity of sex, is to rob us of the fun, what the rest of the world is doing, our pleasure, but it's not. Don't be misguided. 
as we dig through the scriptures, what we see each time is to, it's to bless you. It's to bless your marriage. It's to bless your children. It's to bless your grandchildren. It's to bless your great-grandchildren. And on and on that family tree goes. It's always a blessing. Warren Wiersbe says this, love it. Whenever God says no, it is that he might say yes. Whenever God says no, it's that he might say yes. The sexual impurity, listen, begins in the desires of the heart. It begins in the desires of the heart. And we have decisions to make. How will we live this out? Will we obey the scriptures? Or will we neglect this part of the, of the scriptures? Go with the other stuff? Like, I'm good. I can get down with the don't murder somebody. But, I, you know, I kind of want to do what I want to do over here. No. Uh, look at verse 28. I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his, his heart. Uh, we see the look and we see, uh, and we see the man. The look that Jesus refers to is not a, a casual uh, glance. Some might take it at that. I, I mean, I could never walk around. We could never walk around. We'd be running into everything. Life would be over. <laughs> That's not what Jesus is talking about. It's not what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about that, that constant stare. That You know what I'm talking about. That constant stare with the purpose of lusting. You're staring. You're not taking your eyes. You're not removing your eyes away because you're, you're feeding something within you. That's the heart of what Jesus is talking about here. The man Jesus refers to looked at the woman with the purpose of feeding his sexual desires. It was not accidental. It was planned. And some of y'all, if we're to be honest before the Lord today would say, there are some things that I need to remove in my life because uh, it's encouraging me to constantly stare. Uh, some, some need to either be removed from even social media or, or you need to watch wisely who you allow to accept as your friends or followers you know how many fake accounts there are out there and how many men that I know are struggling uh, in the area of purity, giving into pornography because they're, oh, this, this, it, th no, that's not a real person. That's fake. And you better run from that. You better delete that. How many times, uh, even in the workplace, there's these kind of fun jokes that kind of start being thrown around and. Next thing you know, it's like, oh, it's, it's, it's all innocent. It's, it's good. Next thing you know, there's desires welling up inside of you. And that pretty lady walks by and you, you're giving in to lust. This message that Jesus is sharing, by the way, is not just for men. The percentage of women addicted to pornography and women flirting and women in affairs is at an all-time high. This, this message of purity, listen closely, church. This message of purity is for both men and women. It's for both men and women. We see in verse 29, there's, uh, it's all kind of craziness going on. <laughs> you see it in verse 29, verse 30. All kind of craziness. Gouge out the eyes, cut the limbs. Like, what is Jesus talking about? Jesus is using a figure of speech. He's, he's not speaking literally. What is he telling us? Uh, we need a spiritual surgery. There's something that needs to be to changed within us. There's something that needs to be cut out within us. Those wicked, evil desires need to be replaced with godly ones. That we might honor the Lord in this area of purity. And so how do we get victory? I want to encourage you to write these three points down. How do we get victory? The first is purify the desires of the heart. Purify the desires of the heart. Now, my greatest fear as pastor is uh, that you just 
you just hear this one message and it sinks and it feels good in this moment, you agree, but then we walk out having forgotten everything that was said and studied by this afternoon. I encourage you to take notes, that way you can go back and you can revisit, but, but purify, how do we get victory? Some of you are like, man, I want victory in this area. I, even, with the, even with the anger, I, I don't be angry anymore. How do we get victory? Purify the desires of, of the heart. I ask the Lord to do a surgery within me. Lord, is there any wicked way? I've already said it. Is there any wicked way within me? Remove anything that's not honoring you, anything that's not pleasing to you. Purify the desires of my heart. Listen, appetite leads to action. You know what I mean? Appetite always leads to action. I told at 9 a.m. I was already hungry, rumbling, grumbling. And so you better believe that by the end of the day, we're going to get something to eat here. It's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be good. I don't, I don't know what it is. Anything at this point is going to be good. But, but, but you, you know what it's like to, to sit down at that restaurant and praise God for a the Texas Roadhouse with those rolls and you stuff them with that butter and man, I'm ready to go. You know what it is for that appetite though? It's like you can be on the best, I mean you can, you can have the best uh, framework even, thoughts in your minds of man, I'm, we're, we're, we're kicking it high gear, we're getting back in shape, we're doing some things. Uh, but then the appetite starts coming on. And you start thinking, you start getting hungry, you start moving, driving down the street, seeing billboards and talking about it. Your phones are listening, you know what I'm saying? And it's like, I'm done. It's over. Every time leads to action. And so if you want to get victory, listen, church, purify the desires of your heart. God, what needs to be removed from my life and replaced with things of you? Second, would you write this down? Discipline the actions of the body. Discipline the actions of the body. We are living in a time, quickly, we're living in a time that uh, there is a severe lack of discipline. Uh, we're, we're living in one of the most obese times in America, that is, and, uh, and we need discipline. We need to be a disciplined people. One of the marks of a follower of Jesus should be a disciplined life as we're under uh, surrender under Jesus. And so if you want victory, listen, discipline the actions of the body. Don't go to certain places. Don't go to certain places. Don't watch certain things. Don't listen to certain, you know, things, music. If, if you know, you know that you know, one, it's not going to honor the Lord. And two, it's only going to create different desires, flaming them up. You have to be disciplined. And then third, Third, as we close, is this. How do, how do we get victory? Consider the influences in your life. This isn't a message just for the younger folks. No. This is a message for all folks. This is a message for all ages. Consider the, the influences in your life. Who, who are you allowing to have a loud voice in your life? Who are you spending the most time with? Who you spend time with, uh, you become. Do you know that? Uh, whether you want to believe it or not. Uh, and so who are you allowing to influence your life? Who is it? Consider those influences that are pulling you away from Christ rather than pushing you towards, towards him. Jesus wants us to know more of the righteousness of God. Jesus wants us to obey his standard. Jesus wants to, us to share it with others. The moral law of God, listen, has not changed Sin is still sin. And God still punishes sin. Just because we want to think some different thing or, or believe some different thing or institute some other, you know, whatever, the ways of the world. No, no, no. Sin is still sin. I want to close the day with this text from John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verse 3. The scribes and Pharisees, that's the religious leaders of the day, brought a woman caught, caught in adultery, making her stand in the center. 
Teacher, verse 4, teacher, they said to him, this woman was caught in the act of committing adultery. Don't, don't, don't think too much longer about that. Verse 5, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. So what do you say? They asked this to trap him in order that they might have evidence to accuse him. There's no trap in Jesus, by the way, okay? Jesus stooped down. What did he do? Started writing in the ground with his finger. Verse 7, when they persisted in questioning him, he stood up and said to them, the one without sin among you should be the first to throw a stone at her. Do you hear Jesus' response? Do you hear it? The one without a stone or without sin among you should be the first to throw a stone at her. Then he stooped down again. I mean, talk about a mic drop moment. I mean, a mic drop moment. He goes right back, says it right back down. Then he stooped down again and continued writing on the ground. When they heard this, they left one by one. They were like, yeah, yeah, that's me. Left one by one, starting with the older men. Only he was left with the woman in the center. When Jesus stood up, he said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, Lord, verse 11. No one, Lord. She answered, neither do I condemn you, said Jesus. Then listen to what he said. Go and stay in your sin. No, that's not what Jesus said. <laughs> Open your Bibles. Go and from now on, do not sin anymore. That's what Jesus said. Go and from now on, don't sin anymore. You have been free. Listen, hear it again. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 8, verse, verse 1. You, you, you might have blown it even this week. You might have blown it. You might have missed it. The grace of God is available. It's fresh. It's new. It's not a license to stay in your sin. No, we're to move forward and grow in maturity, becoming fully devoted followers of Jesus, living out the mission and call of Jesus for our, for our lives. And so would you bow your heads and close your eyes? All across this place, those online, would you do that? Just for a moment here. I want to encourage you to consider. Consider the words of Jesus. Go and sin no more. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Some of you today might be struggling with anger. Maybe somebody in the house online has even murdered someone. All of us guilty, I'm sure, of throwing names and insults. There's someone that's hurt you deeply. And you're holding on to that hurt. Maybe you're struggling with purity. And the Lord wants to set you free. I don't know what your response is today, but uh, I want to encourage you. Just spend a moment. We're going to sing this song. And as we sing this song, there's going to be some men and women. If you're in the house, there's going to be some men and women on both sides of the stage. And if you've missed it, they want to be able to come alongside of you and pray with you. They don't need to know all the details. God knows them all. There's something special, powerful about someone just praying with you. So I would encourage you as we sing this song to take that next step. If you're online with us, you're online with us. There's someone, a host that would love to pray with you, love to come alongside of you, even online, even though there's a distance, we'd love to walk with you. Maybe there's one here today that uh, you've never made that first step of Salvation, surrendering over to the Lord Jesus. And so today would be the day of salvation for you. Today would be the day of salvation. Would you make that, that decision today? Call upon the name of the Lord, the Bible says. Ask him to forgive you of all your sins. Believe that he came, that he died, that he rose again. Commit to following him all the days of your life. 